In today's video, I'm going to share why I feel like most gut advice out there isn't very useful, so stay tuned. If you're new here, welcome. My name's Amanda Malachewski. I'm a certified functional nutrition health coach and a digestive and allergy detective. For weekly videos on how to make the best sense of gut healing diets and supplements, please consider subscribing and be sure to hit the bell to be notified when I post a new video. So every time you turn around, there's more gut health advice. So, you know, fast more, fast less, eat more coconut milk, don't eat this, eat this, don't be too restrictive, be restrictive. And gosh, it's just obviously kind of exhausting for people. So as an IBS and SIBO gut health coach and a former IBS and SIBO sufferer, I wanna share some thoughts about why this kind of advice drives me and my clients crazy and why it's really the wrong kind of advice to be focused on. I'd also like to share about what I think you should be focusing on instead to make some real progress with your gut health issues. So let's get started. So let's just get right into the meat of things. Most gut health advice doesn't come with any caveats. And for me, this is a huge red flag. If there's one thing I can say for sure after working with hundreds of clients, it's that there are no absolutes. There are patterns of things that can help people with bloating, constipation, and diarrhea. Like for example, if you have these symptoms, you are more likely than the average person to be sensitive to a group of foods called FODMAPs, which are fermentable carbohydrates. FODMAPs also may not be a problem for you and relying on this rote recipe and rote protocol can actually lead you down a road where you're uh, a lot more restricted and you're restricted unnecessarily and this can make your quality of life really difficult unnecessarily. So each and every piece of gut health diet advice is useful in a certain time and place, but you have to understand exactly what time and place is right to use them before you actually try them. We could pick any piece of gut diet advice. I don't really care what it is, whether it's fasting or specific diets or you know a particular nutrient. And I could give you an example of a time where using that food or that diet worked beautifully for a client. And I can also probably give you an example of a time when it made a client feel a lot worse. Each and every one of you is totally unique. And we have to take that into account when we're choosing our pieces of advice to follow. If we rush the process or use the wrong tool at the wrong time or get overly rigid and dogmatic, this can definitely roll back your, process, your progress or make things even worse. So ultimately, if gut health diet advice doesn't come with caveats, I wanna encourage you to avoid that advice and to instead commit yourself to using gut health advice that is likely to work for you, that's based on indicators from your body about what exactly it needs, or that it's based on a theory that's actually likely to work given your situation, given your symptoms, given your uh, case presentation. The second reason I feel like most gut healing advice out there is kind of bogus is that there's often no exit strategy. So if you've ever started a very restrictive gut healing diet and found that you felt better, that's amazing. And that's to be celebrated because this is helping you control your symptoms and it buys you time to focus on other things. But what I often find is a lot of people are using these diets for a really long time period and they've never um, thought ahead to like, how am I going to get out of this? because it's really difficult to maintain a restrictive diet for a long period of time. Most advice about elimination diets focuses an awful lot on the elimination piece and not enough on the strategy for what happens after that. So the main point of these gut healing diets is to help you pinpoint your most likely food triggers so you can get some symptom control, which again, buys you time to then focus on the underlying causes rather than making you a food martyr for the rest of your life. We don't really want you being a food martyr now, if that restricted diet is what it really takes to control your symptoms, then by all means, go right ahead. You know, there I do know clients who have very narrow diets and it's because they have a lot of reactivity and it can be very difficult to find our way to minimize that, but that's sometimes what we have to do. But in most cases, once you know that a particular diet change helps you and has reduced symptoms, then it's time to start thinking about reintroductions and using this process to pinpoint the specific foods that were responsible for the symptoms that have improved. If you don't have a food reintroduction strategy, you risk malnutrition and weight loss and definitely kind of a loss of your normal social life. It can be difficult to go out to eat. It can be difficult to date. It can be challenging to eat with your family. Um, you know, and these are kind of hard things. So if you're simply applying gut healing diet advice without an exit plan, this usually isn't a very constructive experiment because it's leaving out half of the process. And it really becomes more of a fear-based exercise that trains you to fear certain foods that you may or may not actually need to remove. 
And truthfully, this leads a lot of people who are working with gut healing diets into something akin to an eating disorder where um, the nervous system is really overly activated and avoidant towards foods that otherwise may be healthy. Instead, I always recommend approaching food experiments with the mind of a scientist and looking at it as a temporary change unless you prove beyond any doubt that the foods that you're removing are helping improve your symptoms. As an example, one of my recent clients came to me having been on the Candida diet for at least two years. And if you're familiar with this diet, it's pretty challenging to maintain for the long term because it requires you to forego uh, carb-rich foods. So this is sugars, fruits, starchy vegetables like potatoes and carrots, and certainly any added sugar, also vinegars and alcohol. And it's tricky to maintain it over the long haul. So the symptoms that had prompted the use of this diet for my client had been under control for quite some time, but she hadn't yet gone forward to see if she could wean herself off of this diet. So we set out to help her add back in some convenience foods and things that might make her life a little more easy. And as she reintroduced those foods, she didn't see any increase in her candida symptoms. And so it looks to me like she didn't need to continue to be on that diet for the long term. So again, I want you to make sure to plan an exit ramp into your food experiments so that you can only continue to avoid the foods that really and truly need to be avoided. And otherwise you can add back in foods that are healthy, nourishing, and aren't really a problem for you. I'm curious to hear if you've ended up on a diet longer than you should have. Click like or leave me a comment below the video to tell me about it. The third reason I find that a lot of gut healing advice is kind of bogus is that what I have found working with clients is that in most cases, your best symptom control diet will not fit into any pre-made box. I've had quite a few questions from viewers about what is your diet like, or what did you eat while you were treating SIBO? And the truthful answer to this question is that it really doesn't matter because what's right for you is going to be unique and different from what was right for me. But if I can expand on this answer a little bit, I can't say what diet I eat because the diet I eat doesn't fit into a box. It doesn't fit into one of the pre-made diets. So let me explain. So if you've seen some of my earlier videos where I talk a little bit more about my backstory, you'll know that I've tried a lot of therapeutic diets. I started way back when, um, long before I was a health coach with a gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free diet for a short period of time. And then I moved on to the keto diet. And then I tried something called the metabolic typing diet. And then I tried a diet that was informed by a food sensitivity test that I had taken. And then I tried a low histamine diet. Then I tried a low oxalate diet. And then very late in the game, I worked with the low FODMAP diet. And I was doing these diets to try and address my hormonally induced digestive symptoms. With each diet, there was a pretty major overhaul of my diet, like a pretty major shift. And some of these changes were quite extreme. And in hindsight, I noticed that a lot of my symptoms would get worse when I made these changes, not better. So that's a really big red flag right there. <laughs> if you're noticing that your symptoms are getting worse when you, within a few weeks after making a dietary change, that's not a sign that you're having a detox or it's working. It's a sign that it's not working and it's not the right diet for you. And you've also just identified one of the negative mediators for your symptoms. But anyway, it wasn't until I learned how to use proper food symptom tracking that I was able to really drill down to figure out the specific foods that I was reacting to regardless of what diet I was on. And it turned out they were all over the map. Some of them were on the high FODMAP list, some of them were on the high oxalate list, a few of them were on the histamine list. And you know, there's no rhyme or reason to it. They're kind of random and all over the map. And the long and the short of it was, is that there wasn't a pattern. I had to move away from this thinking of like, I'm gonna find the right pre-made diet to, I have to figure out what's really working for me and not working for me by observing reality, by observing what I'm actually seeing my body doing in response to the foods I'm eating. And this leads me to a really interesting point about making food changes, and this is really important. Truthfully, sometimes all we need to do are make small food changes to see really big results, because oftentimes the culprits are really just a couple of foods or a handful of foods. They're not everything on the high FODMAP list. 
I mean, I do generally believe we do better when we avoid processed foods, so that's a place to start if those are in your diet. But otherwise, when we're looking at a therapeutic diet and thinking, oh, I think my problem is FODMAPs or, oh, I think my problem is histamine foods, we want to think about, well, what are the most likely culprits on this list? What am I already eating that I know is on this list that seems like it might be a problem? Or if I've done a little tracking, where can I identify that, oh, after I ate this food, I get diarrhea. It's happened three times. So I'm starting to move into a space where I'm recommending people make smaller changes at first to see if you can get some traction that way. You can always broaden your approach later if that approach isn't working. So don't feel limited by the confines of a pre-made diet and rely on actual tracking to help you identify where to focus your attention. I have made a whole video about how to use a food symptom diary properly to help you get more clarity about what might be triggering your symptoms. And I will leave a link for that video below this video. And I'm also gonna leave a link for that up here in this corner. So I hope this little conversation has helped clarify some of the nuances of using gut healing diets and tools to help you get better results because ultimately that's what's most important to me is that you succeed in your quest to reduce your bloating, constipation, and diarrhea. No one enjoys those symptoms and I wanna see you pursuing your best life and your goals for yourself free of digestive symptoms. So if you're needing help with resolving bloating, constipation, or diarrhea symptoms, this is just one of the many ways that I help my clients go from food anxiety and supplement confusion to a confident plan for calm digestion. So if this sounds like help you could use, I want to invite you to schedule a free 45 minute discovery call with me to learn more about how I can help you reach your goal of having your digestive symptoms resolved. You can book that call by going to confluencenutrition.com forward slash contact, and I will leave a link for you below this video. I will also leave that link up here in this corner, and I really look forward to meeting you and figuring out if I can help support you. If you like this video, please click like and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and go ahead and share this video with someone else who you think could use it. Um, I've also picked out a few additional videos to help you out here on the side, so go ahead and check those out, and I look forward to seeing you next time.